Hey guys, Hogville Net YouTube Live. Here we are, post game. This is not your mom and dad's uh, kind of exhibition game. This felt, this had a marks feel to it. If the stakes weren't high enough, when you just look at rankings, Purdue, a number one seed last year. Some preseason uh, pro projections have, more than one, have the Boilermakers ranked number one. Number three in AP poll. The game didn't count. Charity exhibition, packed house at Bud Walton Arena. They sold it out. Uh, but this was a big deal for the Arkansas Razorbacks to get a win. Win or lose, they were going to learn from this game. Eric Melsman talked about that, but they got a win. And we had a pregame show today. I don't know if you tuned into that, but just about every talking point I got into in that uh, played out in this game. We talked a lot about who might be the closers on the floor. What, are the, what might a rotation look like, especially at the end of a game? Who are the guys that might have the ball in their hands at the end of the game? We went through multiple Razorbacks we talked about. And – we talk, I talked about the core guys, but we also talked about not only closing, uh, but Arkansas needing to be better at the free throw line to close games. And sometimes it comes down to a handful of possessions. And what kind of team would Arkansas be at the end of a game, not just what success or problems they had during a game, but if they could keep it close, which I predicted they would. I said, if Arkansas keeps it close, which I believe they will, this game's going to the wire, and then it's about making plays. Eric Mosman's back-to-back -back Elite Eight teams – were one, was one of the, the – both of those teams were great at finishing games, a lot of tight games, not a lot of blowouts, and Arkansas was just the better team late. Uh, and I think this is what you would think maybe Purdue would have the upper hand because of how, how often how, – how long these guys have played together and how often they've been in these situations together. Whereas the Razorbacks, some guys have been there, but they haven't been there together. Uh, they've been kind of fragmented. And I even asked Matt Painter, Purdue's head coach, at the post-game press conference. By the way, he's now 28-1 and one in exhibition games. But I had the last two questions, and I said, hey, how did you get ready for Arkansas? Because at the end of the game, end of regulation and overtime, after Debo went out, four transfers were in, in, in there for closing time. Along with Brazil, he didn't have a lot of film on last year. Uh, but he said, you know, uh, you know that he, he kind of went into a long answer, but the point being – there were things that Arkansas understood about Purdue because of this team. Their top eight rotation was pretty much the same as it was last year. You know, uh, the transfer Jones from Southern Illinois uh, being one of the exceptions there. But that's a pretty much a, a, a book that you've read if you study film like Eric Melsman does. It was going to be harder to prepare for this Arkansas team. And, it was gonna, and I think it was advantage Arkansas late. I asked Painter about this. How do you make adjustments when, now when the game's on the line? when you really don't know a lot about these guys. So I think that played in Arkansas's advantage a little bit, but you still have to make plays. This game was fascinating to me. I knew it would be. I felt like, again, this was going to go down to the wire. Uh, but a, a lot of things emerged here. Would Trevor and Brazil start? And would he play the 15 to 25 minutes restriction that Melsman talked about? I recently said in my season preview show in other places on the radio, I said, I don't think he's going to stick to that if the game's winnable. I think he's going to play. More than that. Well, he went over the, the max of 25 minutes. He played 31. Of course, this game went to overtime. But Trevor Brazil, 15 points, 4-7 from the field, 2-4 of four from 3, made all of his free throws, 5-5. Five of five. How big was that? Because Arkansas didn't shoot a free throw for, near, for over 28 minutes. I think Purdue had shot 13, and Arkansas still hadn't shot a free throw. And it was just under 12 minutes, and Brazil got fouled on a 3, made all 3. Arkansas made its first 7 th free throws. How about, in, in, in addition to the 15 points, five rebounds, three steals, one assist, and one block? Really nice stat line. A plus eight in the box score. That was one of the best. Uh, when you look at the box, that was one of the best pluses. Arkansas wins by four. He doubled that when he was on the floor, the advantage for Arkansas. But those 31 minutes might be as big as anything. As well as he played two big threes early in the second half, uh, these teams traded blows. And Purdue, this is a well-oiled machine in a lot of what it did today, offensively and at times on defense. But what I really liked about Arkansas, no matter how crisp Purdue looked in, in their communication and guys getting the spots and it wasn't clustered or cluttered, they just looked like a well old machine until they tried to attack Arkansas. And granted, this team dominated the glass. We knew they might do that. I said Arkansas kind of needed to stay close there, needed to try to stay close and free throws. But Arkansas needed to get the advantage in turnovers. Arkansas had some self-inflicted wounds. I was concerned about that. But forced 20 turnovers, 14 steals. We know what they did to Division Two. 20 turnovers in that game, 12 steals. They actually had more steals against Purdue. And I thought that part on defense, what Arkansas was able to do defensively there, and then what Arkansas was able to do on offense, even though the, the fast break uh, wasn't a huge advantage, I thought Arkansas got downhill a lot. Somehow you got beat 14 to one on the glass. You lost 17 to nothing in second chance points, but you won 
34 to 20 in the paint. And that means guys were getting downhill, getting to the basket. I thought there was a lot of contact on those drives. And maybe Arkansas should have shot more free throws. Mussman didn't wasn't asked about it post game. We didn't talk about it. That's a long time to go. Uh, we have many possible with the I, I missed some of that. But look, some things here just absolutely fascinate me. I talked about having four transfers on the floor in closing time. Devo got hurt. Devo was in foul trouble in the first half. This was a game where Devo took three shots. How many times in his career have we seen Devo have games where he only gets up one shot? And he, or maybe he didn't take a shot, or he, it's not his game offensively. But he did have a team, you know, uh, he joined Tremont Mark uh, with, with four assists to lead the team. Uh, he had three rebounds, I think, but he also had three steals, so he's very active, very tough defensively. But let's talk about Tremont Mark, because as much as anybody, this guy, you could maybe say if you had to pick one guy as a hero, is it him? I mean, 15 points, most of that came at the end of – Regulation when he hit that big three to tie it with 22 seconds left. I asked Mussman, was he supposed to just read, read that situation? Tremont Mark had the ball in his hands a lot at the end of this game. I talked about it early in pregame. I said, you're going to have multiple guys sharing primary handler duties. L. Ellis will be the first guy. But at the end of games, pay attention. It could be different guys based on what Mussman's feeling as the game changes. I talked about pace throughout for 35 minutes. What would pace get? Like it tends to grind down. The truth is, even though there were some grind moments, I thought Arkansas's pace got better once they got to overtime. They had some sloppy possessions to start OT, um, but they came, they, you know, kind of came came back around and had a 7-0 run there, to, that, which really was the difference of the game. Went from down two to up five, and that was, you know, they stayed in the lead from there. But going back to Mark, the big three off the bounce with about 22 seconds left, Mussman said, you know, they were actually looking for a three on that. They weren't going to try to play the long game, stretch the game out, and get, attack the basket, see if they can get an and one and tie it that way, or at least get to the foul line for two free throws or score a two. Then you're down one, 69-68 it would have been, and then you play the long game, try to get a turnover, maybe fouls. He talked about that. I asked him about it. Uh, but they were riding with a three on that play, and Mark was confident. Here's a guy that he's, you started to see him hit some mid-range shots. He hit one in the first half after miss, misfiring a little bit. He had a couple in the second half, and then that three was – to me, that, that set him on a course from there. Now, he did struggle at the free throw line. He missed four consecutive, including three in a row uh, in, the, in the overtime. But then he hit uh, – he, he, he snapped that streak and ended up making his final three to help ice the win. He finished three of his last four after starting OT with a couple of misses. Um, but he also had a mid-range jumper after L. Ellis. Here's another guy, unsung hero. Uh, it wasn't his best game. He didn't look nearly as sharp as he did against more inferior competition. But he did come in after Devo got hurt, finished out the last two and a half minutes of regulation. And in overtime, after Arkansas had three bad possessions and, and Edie had hit a couple of free throws and Arkansas was down two, he gets a hard drive and finishes a nice touch off the glass uh, after a big contacted him on that. He gets the N1, makes the free throw. Arkansas goes up. Uh, the next time down, he gets a little drive into the paint. And you could see he was starting to fill up. This guy has been a high-level scorer everywhere. And he's trying to balance scoring and facilitating. And I thought he just let his instincts take over on a couple of possessions there. Those possessions put Arkansas on the lead for good. Arkansas gets another stop on defense, comes back down. Mark hits a 16 pull-up jumper right close to the nail. Uh, and Arkansas now is up five. They were down two, 7-0 run. I talked about that. Purdue comes down, hits a three. I think it was Jones, the transfer that hit it, gets back within two. Uh, but let's look at overtime. Arkansas was – Arkansas made – Arkansas was three of five shooting from the field in overtime, 60%. Six of nine from the free throw line. Everybody made their free throws except Mark had those three misses in a row to start, and then he, he made three in a row after that. Chandler Lawson iced the win after getting a steal. Uh, in the closing seconds, they, he was fouled and made both of his free throws. We're going to talk about his game. Man, this guy. Talk about transfers here or closing games for you. Uh, but I thought, we, we, you know, with Mark, his offense really started to come around. But Musman trusted him with the ball to close the game in his hands. We've seen guys like Mason Jones in that role. At times, it was Isaiah Joe. It was just who had the hot hand or what was the matchup. I was at Ole Miss, uh, right, the game Joe injured his knee, and it really hurt Arkansas for that. Arkansas started 3-1 and one in SEC play that year, by the way. And that road game was back and forth. And Zay had, I think, seven threes and 34 points that got hurt. But he was the guy they were going to. It's been J.D. Note. It's been other guys they've, they've played through. And tonight it was Tremont Mark. Musman's talk throughout offseason. 
when he talked about four or five guys that could handle the ball, he was talking, he would always bring up Mark's name. Now we see why. We understand why this guy, uh, you know, to me, there was a Devo element to him take putting the hogs on his back uh, in those situations. With Devo out, there was a Devo element. Uh, and that's those are two guys that have had a lot of NCAA Bay tournament ex- success, so it doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, but Chandler Lawson, what can we say about his game? Ten points, three or four from the field. He was one of two from three, made all three of his free throws. Only had two rebounds, but guess what? He was battling Zach Eady, and I thought did a great job. He started, uh, got they got Eady in foul trouble, so he did. You know, he had a rough first half, only one of two from the field. Uh, he, you know, he got going in the second half when they started kind of have their way uh, to get back in the game. I thought Arkansas had some bad stretches uh, when Arkansas went up seven, had a little run, went up seven. They had three bad possessions. Devo took a 26-footer that was way short. I think before that, he tried someone tried to make a lob pass uh, over the entire defense, and it was stolen. Arkansas uh, uh, had another quick shot that wasn't a very good one. Uh, and then in overtime, they started really poorly. Uh, I think Mark missed two free throws. And then Arkansas's next possession, uh, the Hogs had a, a shot clock violation. Uh, and then on the next offense possession, Arkansas had, I believe it was a backcourt turnover. The ball was passed and, and skipped into the backcourt, and that was a turnover. So Arkansas picked it up from there. I mentioned that 7-0 run with Ellis getting it going. Mark with the pull-up, Jay. Then the free throws, Chandler, Eisen, and Arkansas gets a steal. Arkansas holds Purdue. I'm going to give the overall stats, but in overtime, I mentioned Arkansas, 3 of 5 from the field, 6 of 9 at the line. Purdue in overtime? Two of seven shooting, and Arkansas got that that final turnover. Even though uh, the Hogs were probably going to go ahead and win that game, uh, you, you know, you stretch it out at that point to you know a six point lead with about six and a half, six point eight seconds left. So you're still a two possession lead, but now the other team in less than seven seconds has got to knock down two threes, and in between, either get a steal or hope you miss free throws when they foul you to stop the clock. Uh, but that still was big, still at any rate, because Purdue, you know, kept. Trading shots with Arkansas. I honestly thought Arkansas was a better team. Arkansas didn't always look like the cleaner team in terms of still figuring things out. Purdue looks like a team that has got things figured out. But Arkansas, to me, the, was the better team when you look at depth. Let's talk about bench scoring, shall we? Cliff Battle, pregame. I said, I think he's probably – I said, he could sneak him in to the starting lineup and play a small ball lineup. I doubt they did that against Purdue, and he's probably a six-man. That was pretty much his role, 32 minutes – uh, 12 points. He scored six in each half, but five big rebounds. If you go down the stretch of this game in the second half, he got some big, tough rebounds. Arkansas got was minus 14 overall on the glass, 42-28. This is what Purdue does. They beat you on the glass, especially the offensive glass, and then they they have a big disparity in free throws. That was the case again, but they weren't great at the free throw line. Uh, Purdue ends up uh, 17 to 25, 68 percent, and um, Arkansas 13 to 17, 76.5. Half of those, all of those misses were by Mark. He ends up four of eight, and he redeemed himself making his last three in overtime. But everybody else that stepped to the line, once Arkansas started getting there, knocked down free throws. Chandler Lawson, I mentioned that, three of three. Trevor Brazil, five of five. Uh, Ellis on that three-point play in overtime made his free throw. That and one to get Arkansas back in the lead by a point. Uh, you know, going through this, you know, talking about Lawson and the two rebounds, guess what? He did his job on 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 Edie. Held him to nine rebounds, and and got him got him in foul. Helped get him in foul trouble. He fouls out at the end of the game, uh, but you know nine rebounds is respectable. Uh, but you got to seal a guy off like that, and sometimes you sacrifice your own stats for the betterment of the team. But three blocks, three steals, uh, box score plus six in thirty three minutes. I thought Chandler Lawson showed why Musselman gave gave him the nod in the, at the starting center. Makai Mitchell, who's Arkansas's regular starter, I think this is one of those situations in this game the matchup wasn't there. If you look at Mitchell's minutes, uh, he did a couple of good things. He had four points get to the rim, three rebounds, two seals, and a block, but he had a couple of turnovers in 20 minutes. 20 minutes was about his average last year, but he was a box minus six, and I thought – uh, Purdue's front line was a little quicker than him and, and, and a little hungrier getting to the ball. Uh, and he paid for it a little bit, and they, they had some advantage there. So I could understand matchups, matchups. Musselman knows what he's doing. Start Chandler Lawson. He ends up being the closer on the court, uh, and it worked for Arkansas. This guy has his hand in everything. What have I been saying? I use that word connector. He connects. He connects, he connects you on defense. He helps set your defense because he's a threat to create havoc down there. No matter how well the offense seems like it's moving, at some point someone's got to take a drive, 
and they got to challenge somebody, and he's he's ready for that. He plays a smart game and uses that seven foot plus wingspan. So a pretty play turns ugly all of a sudden because that guy's in there mixing it up. Tremont Tremont Mark did the same thing. We mentioned Mark's fifteen points and how he fit, did offensively. I didn't go through this. Six big rebounds, four assists. That was tied for the lead with Devo. Two blocks from the wing, a steal. His box plus six. I mean, you know. It was great to see Trevor Brazil back. I think he and Edie were kind of similar. Edie finishes with 15 points, 13 in that second half. Only had one block, averaged two last year. Averaged nearly, third, what, 12, 13 rebounds, got nine. Uh, 15 points below season average last year. That happened sometimes, but Arkansas did a great job of keeping him in foul trouble, uh, necessitating, negating him, excuse me, most of the game except kind of the early stages of that second half. Uh, but he's going to get some. You know, he's going to get some. I thought Braden Smith. You look at his stat line for a six-foot guard. His arm length for a six-foot guy is pretty nice. You talk about Chandler Lawson, but for a six-foot guy, Smith's got got a wingspan. And I, when I look at his stats last year, it was so similar in this game. Uh, he, he ends up with, um, I think he had 12 points. He was three attempts shooting, so Arkansas did its job on him defensively in terms of field goals. Four, seven turnovers on him. Now, he did get five rebounds and four assists, similar stats to last year. You go, how does a six-foot guy average four and a half rebounds? Well, he's he, – most calls them scrappy. They're also smart, and they just track to the ball. They track to the ball. But seven turnovers. Uh, Musselman talked a lot in his press conference the other day about Kaufman Wren, one of the front, front line guys that led this team in the exhibition season overseas in the summer in scoring. Arkansas did a pretty good job on him. He had his moments, but, held, you know, nine points – only three rebounds, and they forced four turnovers on him. So Arkansas, two guys that were key for Purdue, Arkansas did a good job. Lawyer was the other guard, double-figure score last year, 15 points, but only two of six from three. Uh, shot overall pretty good, six of 13. That's not bad. Uh, but I thought Arkansas did a good job defending the three. Let's go back to Purdue's overall shooting, 26 of 67. That's 38.8% from the field. You did your job. This team – uh, eight of 27 from three shot. Arkansas held it below 30, just under 30% there. 17 to 25 at the free line. I mentioned that. Uh, so they take uh, eight more free throws than Arkansas does Purdue, but the Hogs uh, made only four fewer. So Arkansas shot better at the line, didn't, didn't get there until late in the game. I mean, 28 minutes of game time, it's hard to do that. I think, it, I think at that point, uh, Purdue only had like six fouls in the entire game through 28 minutes. And so you're not going to get into the bonus. You're not going to get to the line if they're not calling it. And when you look at Arkansas having a 34 to 30 advantage in paint, despite getting killed on the glass, that means guys were getting downhill. They were driving into guys. I saw it all game long. They couldn't get those whistles for a while. And it, I think later on, uh, they just kept wearing down and wearing down and attacking. And I thought when Purdue tried to attack, they had some moments, they had some and ones, uh, some putbacks. But overall, I thought Arkansas did a better job of disrupting drives and I think Arkansas offensively, even though some of their drives were disrupted and they had some unforced turnovers, and Purdue, credit Purdue for some that they caught, uh, Arkansas had 15 giveaways, but I thought Arkansas did a better job of finishing. And there's craft throughout this lineup now. This is something Arkansas missed last year. Even Jeremiah Davenport in 11 minutes, uh, only uh, Davenport was only one of four from three, and he got in the paint and had another bucket. Um, so he finishes with five points in 11 minutes. But he, he was a box plus three. Joseph Penny only took one three in six minutes, but he was a box plus five. Sometimes box score minus can be deceptive. But when I noticed when they were on the court and there was a, st a stretch they were on the court together, Arkansas's pace picked up and the defense had to, had to counter. The defense had to alter and adjust. And sometimes when you do that, maybe the three-point shooters aren't hitting right there, but other guys are getting some success because now the way the defense has to – adjust and cover a shooter, create space, and other guys can then maybe have a little more – have some success in those stretches when those guys are in there. Very interesting. I think I think those guys. Layden Blocker, eight minutes, and, man, was he something – when in that first half, the scoring was hard to come by. It was kind of, you know, a grind the first half. I thought Arkansas's pace got better as the game went on, especially – uh, stretches in the final 10 minutes. They had some bad stretches with bad possessions, and it wasn't about their pace, but just mistakes. Uh, and then in overtime, I thought their pace got even better after some early mistakes. Uh, but Blocker, six big points. I talk about him being fearless all the time. He drove in, drove inside and attacked. He had a pull-up shot 
uh, you know, 19, 20 footer at the end of a shot clock in his minutes in the first half. And this again is a game that's going back and forth. It's not like Arkansas had a cushion and he's playing with house money. Th- th- these are clutch minutes. In fact, you could argue that in his minutes of the first half, he, he played better than L. Ellis did. Um, you know, I thought L. Ellis struggled at times in this game, but I also think what he showed in overtime, he just turned, he just flipped that switch to score. I talked about those back to back buckets that put Arkansas back in the lead. Uh, and then he had another possession where he came down, and you could tell he was feeling it. He, he, uh, he drove baseline and pulled up for like a 17-footer, and it just missed. I mean, it, it looked like it, it looked good, but it was a little long and skipped out. But you could tell when a scorer is starting to feel that groove and starting to feel it a little bit. So Mosman's going to be working with him, I know, about reading those situations, when to go, when to look for something better. Uh, sometimes you want guys to be green-lighted. Mosman said in the post-game press conference he never considered – taking the ball out of Mark's hands after he missed four consecutive free throws. Obviously, that worked out. I mean, the guy hits a big three, you know, gets him to overtime, misses a couple of free throws. They keep putting the ball in his hand. Yeah, Ellis had the two positions where he attacked, but they kept playing through Tremont Mark offensively. And this is a guy Musselman said over and over and over, you can put it in his hands and let him run your offense. We can see now that that is definitely one of Arkansas's closing strategies. I think a guy like Khalif Battle can be that because he can make free throws, 90% free throws here last year, uh, you know, close to it, 88, 89%. Uh, We saw what he was able to do tonight. And the five rebounds, a lot of those on the defensive end, I probably talked about a little bit earlier, but I thought some of that was big. I brought that up in the press conference. Um, But this was just an outstanding effort from a team that's not exactly brand new, but one of your guys that's been your hero in postseason, Devo Davis, didn't have one of his better games. Three turnovers, three assists, you know, four assists, excuse me, three rebounds, and he, and he had two points. And he scored Arkansas's first basket of the game. The Hogs had fallen by, behind five to zero, and he has a little runner, little mid-range runner, and Arkansas gets on the board. That was it for Devo Davis scoring. He only took three shots, and that one three down the stretch there when Arkansas had a seven-point lead probably wasn't the best idea. Uh Look, and here's the what's so interesting to me about this game. You could argue that this was a classic Nolan Richardson. You guys can get all the rebounds. We're gonna we're gonna create turnovers and get an advantage in the turnover game. Some live ball turnovers. And Arkansas won 14 to seven uh, in the, in the steal category. Arkansas was I think seven to seven to three in block shots. So when it came to those hustle plays on defense and those possession changing plays or offense disrupting plays. On, with your defense, Arkansas was, I think, the better team there. I, th- I think one of the biggest problem areas that kept Purdue in this game, as well as Arkansas shot, I mean, 50.8% for the field. I haven't even talked about that. 30 of 59 is what they finished. 8 of 23 from three, 34.8%. That's actually an improvement over last year in volume, makes, and percentage. It's not lights out, but it's good. It's good, and especially when you're holding the other team to under 30%, and you, you, know, you both teams made eight threes, but Arkansas was a little more efficient there. Arkansas was more efficient at the free throw line. Arkansas was more efficient from the field by a lot. Over 50%, nearly 51% compared to 39%. That's big time. Devo's injury must said he doesn't think it's serious. We It looked like from here, I don't know if they showed replays on the live stream. I haven't seen that, obviously. I'm sure they did. It looked like there might have been some head or shoulder contact crashing into Edie. Well, that's 7-4-300. Guess who gets up from that faster than the other guy? Zach Eady probably, and that's how it played out. And they got Devo out late in the game, and Musk turns to L. Ellis, and I asked him about this in the press conference. I said, you've had great closers in finishing close games, you know, the, those two Elite Eight seasons, not as much last year, but it had that feeling again tonight. And you actually went to your bench and got a closer because L. Ellis was huge in overtime. It was offense, and Arkansas needed a little bit of offense. They had three clunky possessions in a row. And Purdue had that two-point lead, but Arkansas's defense was holding its water. I mean, Edie hit a couple of free throws. That was the two gave them the two-point lead early in the in the overtime, uh, and then Ellis kind of took over for a couple of possessions, and then it was Mark after another stop, and it's now went from a two-point deficit to a five-point lead, a 7-0 run in, in overtime. Arkansas had a 9-0 run to take a lead after being down seven uh, early in the first half. Arkansas had another run, like a 9-4 or 9-4 to get to halftime with a five-point lead. Uh, And then Arkansas, because, yeah, it was a tie game. Arkansas goes on a 9-4 run to have a five-point halftime lead. Then Arkansas had another early second-half run, or midway second-half run that got them up by seven, and that's when they had three bad possessions in a row on offense again. So those are things they can clean up. 
those are things they can identify, work on, and clean up. Uh, but you know, you're, you're looking at a closing group of Trevor and Brazil, who basically hasn't played anybody in a year. Okay, <laughs> Lawson, Lawson uh, excuse me, Chandler Lawson on the front line with him, transfer from Memphis. Not a big stat guy. If you look at his career, people are saying it. And I, I said over and over, I said early before anybody knew it, that this guy was going to battle for a top eight rotation. I did. And I said, it's the little things. And, and I said, if you leave him open, he's going to knock some shots down. He did that today. You can count on that guy to make the right plays, the right reads, and he understands the game. And the, he, I mean, his, his service was invaluable on that front line today. Not only defending Edie, not only helping teammates uh, with, with the deflections and stops he got, because Purdue had a lot of really good screen game and moving the ball side to side and getting ZD in the in, in, uh, leverage like they wanted him to. And, and Lawson just made just disrupted. He, he made some of those clean angles not so clean. He was getting deflections. Uh, he was timing his release off of pinning a guy to go get a steal or to get another deflection. He blocked some shots. I mentioned that. But those two guys on the front line, or basically were unknown commodities. I mean, we knew about Brazil, but not a, we never saw him in SEC play. He missed Arkansas. He's played eight games plus a little bit against Greensboro early December. So that's nine games. Arkansas played 36. My math said that's 27 games he missed, the final 27. So we didn't know what he would do. We, he just, he's, not, he's not been back that long. He had a great pro day. He played 19 minutes the other night against D2, and there was nothing spectacular there. He gave us some cluster plays that told us that's Trevor Brazil. Uh, but tonight, I thought he played a, a really good floor game. But I go to that backcourt, and I was kept talking about the trio. I've been talking about it for weeks. Mark, Ellis, and Devo with battle. Kind of, we're unsure where that's going to land because he missed a lot. He just got back. He got back the week early in the week when they played D two last week. He hadn't been back much. He's missed a lot of time. But I said he will be once he's fully healthy. He brings too much to the table. He's tough defensively. Though some of those rebounds he got in a game where Arkansas was getting killed there were, were just monstrous. He and Tremont Bark both. Six for Mark, five for uh, five for Battle. Uh, and then we saw some of his offense in this game. We saw him, uh, he was two or six from three, but he hit a couple, but he was five of 11 overall from the field. A couple of turnovers, those five rebounds I mentioned. He had a steal, uh, but 32 big minutes. Uh, Ellis ends up with 12 points. I mentioned the five he got in overtime. He scored all, before that, all seven of his points for the first half. And he, and he gave Arkansas, you know, he, I don't think he had a great half overall floor game. But he gave Arkansas some offense in a grind game. He helped Arkansas get not only kind of come back from an early deficit, but, you know, take some leads and hang in there because he had some offense. So seven first half points, uh, but he ends up with 12, uh, three rebounds, three assists, a couple of turnovers, 27 minutes. He sat for a while. He sat a long stretch. He was not in their closing plans until Devo got hurt. That's why I've said so often they are so deep at every position. I asked Mussman about it in my preview show the other night. Do you feel like if a guy gets hurt or you just got to turn to somebody because someone's having an off night, I brought this up. Do you have the pieces to get through that? And he goes, I think I do. El Ellis proved him right. You had a closer come off the bench. Arkansas has struggled to have more than one or two closers in games. It, as good as they've been, that's kind of been true. Uh, you know, a guy like Jalen Williams was a double-double machine and made plays at both ends. And sometimes you would go through him or it was J.D. and Ote, but those were kind of your two guys. Uh, sometimes a Moody, I guess, you know, he, he, he had a good run through SEC and was one of the guys on the team. There weren't many that shot it efficiently from three. Uh, Mason Jones, I mentioned Isaiah Joe. Uh, there was times it was Moses Moody the, the, in year two. Uh, you know, you really didn't play a lot through Justin Smith and Jalen Tate. They did everything, but they weren't necessarily consistently go-to guys on offense. Um, you know, no Tate was sixth man of the year. But, but this team to me has four or five guys. I think you can play through Brazil at the end of games. Not just that he's on the court, but you can run stuff with him. Um, I think, you know, again, we saw Ellis do something. We, obviously, Tremont Mark, that big three to get it to overtime with 22 seconds left. Uh, you know, I was wondering, is, is, he, is this a read? Is he just give it, taking what the defense gave him? He rose up and drained it. This guy hasn't been anybody that signaled, uh, you know, even at, even at Houston, you know, he, he had a good NCAA tournament run and his offense picked up. But he's never signaled that he might be that guy from three in that at that stage in a game. We were thinking other guys maybe, but it was him. You know, I would see him as a guy that you would be slashing, which he did some of that, and get in the mid-range, maybe get to the foul line with some of that. 
Um, but I, I mean, I, I, it was straight on when I saw him rise and release from where I sit at the press table. I, when it came on the other side of its arc and started coming down, I'm like I turned uh, and I said, I told somebody, I'm like, that's going in. And it did. Um, yeah. I'm patting myself on the back a little bit. I, you know, I thought that might be trouble when he pulled from three. I'm like, why aren't they going to the basket? There's enough time to do that. Is that, that the guy you want shooting three? Absolutely. It was because it worked out. Uh, and I thought, you know, I thought Arkansas did a good job defensively after that. Arkansas gave itself a chance to win the game. Uh, you know, got a loose ball, got it, got the other way. Ellis drove in, presence of mind with the clock, and just missed. You know, he just missed. You know, he probably got a little wide before he got to his release and his momentum carried him. He couldn't get the ball up on the glass far enough and high enough to give himself a chance to finish it with touch. Uh, but that's what sent the game to overtime. So many talking points tonight. I mean – Purdue plus 12 offense or plus 13 offense rebound, 14 and one. I talked about it. Plus plus 14 overall rebounding, 42 28, 17 and nothing in second chance points. Some of those pregame talking points that I went through were saying Arkansas has got to find a way to be competitive on the glass. They did that for a while. Arkansas was in it. They were close enough. You know, minus five at halftime, you'll take that. ED wasn't killing you, only two points. Some other guys a little bit, but you were hanging in there. Arkansas was plus three in turnovers, 11-8. So they were almost – it was almost a trade-off. And that was one of the things I taught pregame. If you can't stay close on the board and if you can't stay close in the free throw game, you've got to give them – you've got to pressure them with things that they have to contend with. You don't have to necessarily be even in everything. You've just got to find a way to counter in the strengths in your game to put them at a disadvantage. And, again, even though the turnovers look kind of close, it, it, more of Arkansas's were unforced, and I really thought Arkansas – wreaked havoc on that end of the floor. And then I thought Arkansas also did a great job. I mean, yeah, they took 23 threes. They took 34 the Razorbacks did in the last game. So 11 fewer. They probably could have hoisted up some more, but I saw that I saw a Razorback team that was patient. There were times Arkansas did get in transition. There was a little secondary transition. They don't keep stat on secondary. They've got the fast break at 10 to 6. It was actually better when you add in some secondary. I, I thought Ellis made some good passes. You know, he struggled <clears throat> with consistency. Only turn, you had two turnovers, but there were some disruptive, disrupted offensive sets where he got off his feet and didn't have anywhere to go, and it just disrupted Arkansas's flow, and they didn't have good possession. So I thought he struggled uh, some offensively a lot at times, uh, and I thought he closed the game brilliantly. I thought he was, you know, you know, what can you say other than he he did his job in overtime, uh, and he turned to that he he became that score that he's been so good at, and that helped Arkansas. Um, going back through this, I don't even know who the player of the game is. To me, it's Tremont Mark, probably. I mean, he made big shots, made big free throws when they needed him, made a lot of defensive plays, a lot of rebounds. I think Chandler Lawson and Trevor Brazil are both in that conversation. Um, and I think a tip of the hat to guys like Battle and Ellis. Uh, you know, we know Devo will have better days. And he got hurt. Musk thinks he's going to be all right. I was wondering if it might be a concussion kind of thing. He was asked that in the press conference. Musk said he didn't think so. Packed house, guys. This play, this environment. You know, I asked Painter in post the post game press conference. I had the last two questions, and one of them I asked him did, on a scale of one to ten, what kind of a marks feel did this have? And he didn't he didn't acknowledge that, but he did say it felt like a road game in the Big Ten. And you know, you, well, you'll take that because it's an exhibition game. But if it feels like a road game in your league, we're not talking about non conference and some of the teams you play there. And yeah, you want to win those, and you have some big matchups when you everybody conference. Conference play goes up another level because everybody knows each other. It's a grind. It's physical. It's like a bloodbath. I mean, it's just different, right? And he talked about it being like a conference game. So that was my next best an next best answer to him acknowledging it kind of felt like a March atmosphere in October. And that was in my game story, in my headline. Now, I've got a bare-bones game story. I put it out immediately when it was over. Spent a lot of time in press conference going through, reviewing notes. I wanted to do this first. I'm going to go back and add in all the extra play-by-play -play stuff at the end because this was back and forth, all the stats, uh, quotes, and everything. So I'm going to add hogville.net. I've already got a shell of a game story up. There's some detail in there, not a lot. I'm going to add a lot more once I wrap here. I'm 34 minutes in. I'm going to keep going because I, I felt like this was a statement game. Not It doesn't count. It doesn't help your net. <clears throat> it's not going to help your record. You still got to – you can't – Take this and now think that you're a world beater, and then you know, you know, you know, you have to stay focused. This is a veteran team. Musman knows he's been through all of this at every level of basketball. He knows how to deal with his team and get them to focus on the right things and not, you know, get over their skis on a win like this. But, but 
it was a big win because I think Arkansas had more question marks coming in this than Purdue did. And this is a team, Musselman said at post-game post press conference, that's Zimmerman, Z's walking off the court. Uh, he said it, that this is a team, Purdue, that can win a national championship. They're built to do that. <laughs> they lost to a 16 seed last year as a one seed. So you can laugh about that. Uh, they've had some struggles in postseason, and that's true of that program. But they also had an Elite Eight not that long ago. Uh, and have advanced in NCAA tournament. But I do think when I watch this team, uh, this you know this is a team that can gr learn from its mistakes. But how interesting is it, um, you know, that Arkansas, with more questions, I think, coming in, was the better team in the clutch situations and in the game-winning moments when you thought that would probably be advantage of the team. This crowd, Chandler Lawson said, I think the fans pushed them over the finish line. That's another thing. Nearly 20,000 here. We know what Bud Walton holds when it's packed. Uh, there, there's that energy and that noise, and that and that does raise you up a little bit, and, and you can kind of gut check and get through some stuff because uh, you still have that excitement level because the fans are bringing you that. Uh, Purdue didn't have that. <laughs> they were the visitor today, so that was the advantage of Arkansas. Um, but I do think Arkansas was the better team outside of that intangible that becomes a tangible. I think Arkansas was the better team uh, down the stretch. The scoreboard says they were. This game went to overtime. Both teams – did things to get back in the game when they were behind. They did things to do just enough to get a two or three possession lead at times. Well, it was really Arkansas that did that. I think Purdue had a three possession lead 12 to five early and Arkansas cut into that. I think most of the leads from there that were two or three possessions were Arkansas's. Purdue would claw back, maybe take a one or two or three point lead, but Arkansas did a great job um, you know, of, of being the better team in the closing moments. It looked like Purdue may have may have climbed that hill and they were up three and Arkansas had that one possession. You're like, okay, what's Arkansas going to do now? Do these guys, are they going to play a chess game and play it out? Try to get to the line, try to get to the basket. Are they going to just take a three and live and die with that? Because if you miss that three and they rebound, there's only 20 seconds left and you got to foul them. And now they're up three and now they might, even though they weren't great at the line, you got to think they might have extended to a two possession lead. Uh, but man, Tremont Mark, I mean, he's already, <laughs> this guy has a winning, comes from a winning program and he checked every, I mean, 15 points, six rebounds, four assists, two blocks, one steal and a box six in 33 minutes. And he kind of took the game over in stages there at the end with some L Ellis in their battle, giving you plays Lawson, uh, Chandler Lawson at both ends, Brazil. I mean, you know, Brazil knocking down two threes and playing some of the game he played tonight. Getting out in transition. I love Devo getting the ball to him in transition for that dunk. That was big. This place went crazy. Uh, Purdue had to take timeouts in this game because this, the roof was about to, you know, blast off in October. That, that's never happened. I mentioned Painters 28-1 now in, in exhibition. Arkansas took its lumps last year. Got destroyed uh, down at Texas after being close for a half. I felt like there was no destruction in this game. One way or another, this was going to be a close game, and I thought Arkansas had the pieces to win, but I wasn't sure if those pieces were ready to win. That's what I wanted to see, and I think they obviously were. I saw there's a lot of comments that have been coming up. i got to keep these on if I'm going to read those, and i got to clean them a little bit. They're fogged up. I'm glad you're with me 38 minutes into this. Hogville Net YouTube Live, it's been a busy week, guys. Uh, we had a big uh, hour and a half plus. I talk a lot. Hour and a half plus uh, preview show. We had Eric Mulsman on. Uh, we had Trevor in Brazil, some sound bites from him for an interview he's done with Picture All Nation that'll air in its entirety, uh, I think, on November 7th in PTN's uh, preview show. And we had Isaiah Joe, who's played with Muss, uh, one of the you know four year pro, fourth year pro, who's a, a you know a six man right now for a good Oklahoma City Thunder team. He's helped him get to two and zero already, uh, but he talked about what it means to be a player, to improve yourself, but also be part of the team and help a team win playing for Mus. what Mus's expectations are. If you haven't seen that, I hope you go watch it because Mus was great. We touched on a lot of the, a lot of the talking points and things I brought up and that Musselman answered if I didn't necessarily bring something up. All of that kind of played out here tonight. Uh, and and when my pregame show today, I really wanted to focus on who would closers be if the game is close. I, I wanted to go there because we can talk about individual matchups and how do you defend ED. I talk about it. I'm like, you might not slow him down or you might. But it's other guys can get you too. Um, what are you going to do, even if you have trouble with certain aspects of the game that they excel at? What are you going to do to but to you know counteract it, to counter it? Uh, and I thought Arkansas did enough. The, the offense to me, um, it looked like getting into offense was easier for Purdue than it was for Arkansas. 
But finishing offense was better for Arkansas than it was Purdue. And I think a lot of that's not only the athleticism and length advantages in a lot of positions, quickness, but I think some of it had to do with Arkansas having guys with that. I keep talking about that diversity of skill. Guys can finish in different ways. And a Chandler Lawson, who you're not penciling in as a 10 to 15 point guy necessarily, can get you 10 or 15 points because they're going to be pockets in the game where they don't account for him. They're worried about other guys. So when you have more guys who can shoot from three, who can drive and pull up, I mean, L. Ellis, Khalif Battle, and Truman Mark showed in this game they can pull up. They can. They got a drive game. They got a mid-range game. They've got. They can shoot from three. Um, we know Davenport. I mentioned it. He didn't have a great game. Uh, he did hit a three. He had five points, two of five overall from the field. But when his minutes, he had 11 minutes when he was out there, it impacted the game in a positive way. His minutes led to a box plus positive. Sometimes it's not misleading, but I didn't think it was. I watched the game, and the offense changed a little bit. You want diversity in your offense. You want the skills, these skill sets to help create that diversity that makes defenses account. They have to change. Last year, Arkansas was a one-trick pony. Pack it in, and if we foul them, they probably won't make the free throws. They might turn it over. They're, you know, uh, They're not going to make threes. We want them to shoot threes, and they'll do that too. Uh, and, you know, Arkansas did a good job of overall minimizing some of that last year because they weren't a good three-point shooting team. Uh, but this team, you know, you don't have any problem with them taking 23 because they made 59 field goals. And so they got 36, 36 attempts. Excuse me. They took 59 and made, took 59 overall, 23 from three. So 36 attempts inside the arc. That means they weren't in love with the three-point line. It means they played to other strengths that they have. That goes back to the versatility throughout that lineup at every position. Uh, 30 made field goals, so 22 from inside the arc. They just held a team that was 54% last year from two. That was where one of the you know, top 25 team I think they were in the country in two-point field goal percentage. Had a hard time saying that earlier on the pregame show. I was stumbling over that. Um, they held them to 39%. Uh, that's a huge – that's a 15-point difference. And on the other end, Arkansas, this, that was one of the areas that Purdue – you know, I've talked about the rebounding advantages, free throws. But another area is how good they are inside the arc. Not a great three-point shooting team. Arkansas wasn't last year, but they were really good from two. Not today they weren't. Arkansas contested everything. And even though they were some tough and ones, they got off balance, off the glass. Yeah, there was some contact there. Kudos to Purdue for making some plays. But overall, Arkansas really hurt this team. I didn't see a lot of clean looks that Purdue was just missing. It seemed like Arkansas was contesting just about everything. I don't know what game you saw. Maybe it's, you, someone saw it a little differently, but I thought Arkansas did a great job contesting, getting deflections, disrupting. Uh, that's why you see 20 turnovers, 14 steals. It's also why you see these shooting percentages. Uh, they hit some, you know, the, the Gillis, part of Purdue when Arkansas was trying to build those leads, I think they led by as much as nine, the Razorbacks did in the second half. And Gillis uh, kept getting left open, uh, forward kept getting left open. And he, I think he had three second half threes. Um, and, you know, he you know he was a guy that hurt Arkansas 13 points in this game, but he had three threes in the second half, and it always seemed like when Arkansas was maybe going to stretch it to a double-digit lead or get a little more cushion, he'd hit a big three. Purdue would get a stop, or Arkansas would have an unforced error or a bad shot and come down, and then they'd maybe whittle the lead a little more and stay within range. So, you know, they had guys that stepped up, and these are guys that have played together. They were there last year on a team – that went into the NCAA tournament ranked third like they are now and a number one seed. Yeah, they got upset, but that happens in basketball. It only happens twice in history to a one seed. But, um, you know, th this is to me, as an exhibition game, you're probably wondering why are we spending 45 minutes on it? Because I think you want to win. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a nice feeling. But the way Arkansas won, this wasn't a night where Purdue was off. It just wasn't. You know, Painter's going to talk about not taking care of the ball, not shooting well. A lot of that had to do with Arkansas. Arkansas had more unforced turnovers, I felt like, than Purdue did. And I thought Arkansas had a lot to do with anything that went wrong for Purdue. Uh, but it still was a team that I thought did a lot of things right. And it's a quality team. There's no doubt about that. They're not a paper tiger. You know, they're not a third-ranked team based on what you think they might do. You know that's a really good team. Started 22-1 and one last year. 29 and six, what they finished up. They don't they don't finish as well seasons as they do start them. I and you're getting them in October when they're pretty damn good. And again, Painter, he's been there. It's his 19th season, 28 and now one in in, in exhibition games. So 
uh, they do so they 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 do they they haven't played this level of competition in exhibition season. But they had some secret scrimmages last year. They beat Cincinnati. Uh, I don't know if they count that in his 28 exhibition wins or not. Or it's not technically an exhibition game, but uh, you know, they, you know. So you know, this is something that just like Arkansas going to Texas last year was a first. Arkansas doesn't test itself like that in exhibition season. They do now under Eric Mosman, and you see why. And again, I want to go back to this. I talked about it in pregame. This game benefited sellout, benefited charity exhibition. It benefited the United Way uh, uh, to supply relief for the tornadoes and the victims and, and of tornadoes. Back in late March, I think it was the March 31st, it came through my neighborhood, adjacent neighborhoods, tore, tore up houses, um, you know, businesses. Uh, it was, uh, it, you know, and it continues to be a problem now because I live in that area. I missed my house by two blocks. A lot of people are still displaced. A lot of homes that are still in disarray. A lot of them have been leveled, but that's going to go on for a while, getting things back to right and getting things back to normal. And so an event like this was not only fun for fans, great if you're in the media and you get to cover two top 15 teams, one of them that may be in the conversation preseason national title, great that you get to be in an atmosphere like this. But when you know, too, that the proceeds are going to something like that, it's an extra feel good and it hits home close to me. So I've you know, kind of wanted to go through that a little bit, not spend too much time on it. Next up for Arkansas is the season opener, November 6th here at, at Bud Walton Arena against Alcorn State. That'll be on SEC Network Plus. I hope most of you got to watch it today because that was the channel. Arkansas had, uh, in addition to a packed house, 10 visitors, 10 kids from Arkansas recruits here to watch the game. Jalen Shelley, class of 2024, Arkansas commit, national top 50 guy, four-star, 6'8", combo forward from Frisco, Texas. Playing his senior season at Leak Academy, another loaded power high school team. They're always in the conversation with the Geico national title. He was here. He had a change of plans. He told me early week he probably wouldn't make it. He texted me and I was driving up here to Monsoon to tell me after all he would be here. And I had to wait till I could get to the next exit to tweet it out, put my hazards on. Uh, visibility was tough getting up here, guys. Uh, but it was, you know, this this was all worth it. Uh, but Arkansas had visitors in here. Some of the guys that have Arkansas offers. Class of 2025, Terry on Burgess had committed to coming in here today. 6'9", combo forward out of Benton. He's been to multiple games, including football games. He's been on unofficial visit. He'll be back. He's coming back for the Duke game at a national top 35 guy in his own right in that class of 2025. Another 2025 hog offer, Isaiah Seeley, 6'6", guard out of Springdale, another national top 54 star guy. He's been on campus. He's been on unofficial visit. He was at the red-white game a few weeks ago, October 4th. He, he committed uh, to be here today. And then Aiden Cronister, who was also at the red-white game, class of 2026, just a few weeks ago picked up the hog offer when Eric Musselman called him, 6'7 wing at Rogers. Uh, he's rated number 29, top 30 guy, according to 247 Sports. That's not that's nothing to sneeze at in that 2026 class. It is a deep 2026 class in Arkansas. I go back to 2017, 2020. You know some of the names from those classes if you've been paying attention. 2022, uh, and then this one. This is the next one, 2026. It's really deep, and a lot of top high major guys at the top, You know, top 30-ish, top 50 kind of guys. Maybe some of them eventually be – five stars, but several of them have offers in that 26 class. I mentioned Cronister here today, J.J. Andrews in, in, at Little Rock Christian Academy, uh, Jacob Lanier at Maumelle. Got to see both of those guys practice last week and very impressed with their progress. I saw uh, on the, game, the day of the red-white game, October 4th, I went to Rogers practice and saw Cronister shoot the lights out of it. Uh, so, the, you know, you want this kind of momentum in your program. Arkansas, he looked back. I know people were disappointed eight and 10 last year, all the injuries you had three guys, you knew uh, five stars might be one and done's going the draft that sure enough that happened. It didn't translate because you had two key injuries, Nick Smith, Jr. Brazil, well-documented. Uh, you also had some inexperience of growing pains there. Uh, but I think getting to a sweet 16 validated that recruiting class and what the plan was that year. And you understood the pieces were there. That was final four caliber talent. And you wondered had they all stayed together and played an entire season together, just how good that team would have been. This team, to me, feels is like Musselman's best group. And I think it's got the potential to be the best team at some point. I don't think it's there yet. It's October. I think his second season with Moses Moody and Devo and Jalen Williams finally cracking into the rotation and Jalen Tate and Justin Smith and J.D. Note was sixth man of the year. That was a very good team. What ran off 12 straight wins against SEC competition. 
That only been done once before at Arkansas, and that was back when Nolan had it going in the championship season. So you understood how good that team became. I think this team can maybe come together sooner because of all of that experience with the transfers and guys he brought back. Uh, and I think, you know, there, you know, Moses Moody was an NBA talent on that team, a one and done and a, and a lottery pick. Trevor in Brazil is kind of that guy. You, you think of him that way right now, potentially being that, although there's question marks because of the injury and just getting back. How much up and down does he go through? Does he stay healthy? All that. But there's some similarities there. But I think this team potentially won't have a two and four start in SEC play, potentially. Can they run off 12 straight wins in league play? I don't know that yet. Uh, can, can, it, can this team get to an Elite Eight? The way it's put together, and if things come together like I, I, I think they can, especially today, they telegraphed a little bit, why not? I think it's possible. And so I think this team, again, I thought there was just a few little pieces missing, mostly size and depth on the front line. When you went back to Moses' team, when you went back to the second Elite Eight team, I thought that team really had to grind uh, to, to you know pave its way to get to an Elite Eight more so than the first one. They had a lot of close games, both of them, but one of them I thought was a little better constructed to maybe have a chance to go further. Uh, last year's team, I thought, had they been together the whole time, maybe could have been a Final Four type of team. I think this one can be. I, th I think, that, and not the same way, but I think it can be. So we keep our eyes on it. It's October 28th, it's almost Halloween. Regular season starts just over a week. A lot of things are going to play out. Arkansas has got four home games, start with Alcorn State. All of them are, you know, mid-major teams, and they go to, to the Bahamas. And they've got a, you know, it's a good field out there. Start with Stanford, Memphis, Michigan, second game, win or lose. And then you've got a, the other side of the bracket. You hope you're in the winner's bracket. You've got Carolina, North Carolina, Villanova, Texas Tech, Northern Iowa is in that field. Then you come home for Duke right away. So that is a loaded, that is a gauntlet. Because then after that, you get Furman, first game in December at home. Furman is a one of the better mid-major teams. It's not hurt. You don't hear a lot about knocked off Virginia, four seed, in last season's NCAA tournament. That is a good mid-major program. Then you go at a neutral site to Tulsa to play Oklahoma after that. I don't know that Arkansas had a, a stretch of six consecutive non-conference games that tough with that many challenges, playing away from home, playing out of the country, playing Duke. Even though you get Duke at home, man, what a home schedule, by the way, guys. You knocked off number three. I know it doesn't count, but you still brag about it. People aren't going to know about this. You get number two, Duke. They're preseason number two. We don't know where Arkansas Duke will be ranked in the end of November, about a month from now, November 29th. Uh, but you get them, at, you get that team at home. You get Tennessee preseason number nine at home and in, in league play on Valentine's Day. I think that's going to be the first of a tough three-game stretch because then you go on the road for Mississippi State and A&M, and then you finish the season two of your last three games. Uh, you've got Kentucky out on the road on CBS, and then you're at Alabama. So that's a tough stretch. And then Arkansas, we know, traditionally starts poorly in SEC play. Four games to start the league that matter uh, because you get Auburn, who's no slouch. We know Bruce Pearl's had a good program there. You get him at home to open league play. Then you go on the road back-to-back. -back. Georgia, who I think's improved under Mike White, be careful. That's a road game. Then you're on the road to Florida, who I think might be an inch play tournament team. I think the league could have eight, maybe nine teams that have some inch play tournament value just looking at it from here. Uh, and then you're back home after for game four against that A&M team that's, you know, finished second to Bama last year, has every, all those guys back. Wade Taylor for your preseason SEC player of the year uh, pick. And, you know, that's a team that's Arkansas. That's Those are always a grind. That's not an easy game. And uh, so, you you know, you want to start right in SEC play. Those first four games are tough. Uh, we went through the non-con. So I'm kind of hitting some stuff I hit in my preview show the other day. I uh, decided to get this to an hour. We're 53 minutes in. By the way, let's talk about – I talked about recruiting Jalen Smith – or, excuse me, uh, Jalen Shelley being here today. Jalen Shelley told me he is signing. We knew this. He's going to sign the early period, and they're just working out the details on exactly when, when he's going to do that. You know, they always have kind of like a ceremony. Other players at Link will be signing – because that's they got multiple high major division one guys, uh, but the early period is November eighth through the fifteenth, so it's right around the corner. It starts a day after Ar or two days after Arkansas season opener on on Monday the sixth. Wednesday the eighth is when the early signing period starts. Uh, and then you've got Isaiah Elohim, the six five wing at Sierra Canyon out in California, who's also going to sign early. So uh, you you but you're parlaying this kind of performance. There was a lot of kids in here today. That, that are not class of 2024. I think Arkansas is probably done there when we talk about high school recruiting. So a lot of younger players here, three that I mentioned that already have hog offers. Of course, Jalen Shelley getting to see his future team in a game in an atmosphere like this in October. It's just, Musman said he doesn't even know. He, he, 
he was kind of shocked at the, you know, here's a guy that's seen a lot and done a lot and been in some big games, certainly at Arkansas in the NCAA tournament at regular season. Uh, and, and he's talking about this game right now as being one that's kind of for the ages. And it just blows his mind. You got a packed house for a game like that with two teams like that in October. And I agree with him. I, I think it was worth him. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say he was overly dramatizing that. I think he was spot on. It's an eye opener, uh, even though it doesn't count. And, you know, no one's going to remember this if, if Arkansas has a poor season and Purdue has a great year. No one's going to want to talk about this and vice versa. But I think both teams are going to be really good. And you see why both are ranked so highly, especially – I think I've have felt like Arkansas should have been in the conversation for, for preseason pick to win the SEC. They probably were a little bit preseason pick by the media to be third. You understand that a little bit, um, especially with what A&M brought back on a team that finished second last year. And, of course, Tennessee, for some reason, uh, you know, Rick Barnes, you know, he gets a lot of preseason love, and they back it up sometimes, sometimes not. They had a big injury as well, Ziegler. Mississippi State's dealing with Tolu Smith being out maybe until league play starts. Injuries factor in. It's not just Arkansas. But Arkansas seems like they're slow starts every year. And I brought it up to Melsman in my preview show. It, a lot of that's been about injuries. Uh, and this is a team right now, Jalen Graham, we haven't talked about him. He was not ready to go. That He wasn't close to playing. Melsman acknowledged that in the postgame. Uh, he hasn't practiced much, back spasms. He missed pro day. That was the first I heard, and I was the first to report that he missed pro day. It might might be dealing with something. I couldn't disclose what it was at the time, uh, but to keep an eye on that and, and suggest that he might not play in the in that first exhibition game against D2, which was the case. And then when I got here today and I took out took some video early of guys shooting around and getting shots up an hour and a half for the game, he wasn't on the court. And I knew then, even though no one had disclosed it, probably not going today. And that was the case. I did tweet it out eventually. Uh, there were NBA scouts when I came to get my media credentials. There were a couple from the Charlotte Hornets. I saw a, a, a scout pass on the table for the Milwaukee Bucks. I heard the Sacramento Kings were in here. So several NBA teams in here. Zach Eady's a guy they're looking at. Trevor and Brazil's a guy they're looking at. There's other players in this game. I think I think Arkansas might have some guys outside of Brazil. Uh, they're going to have a shot at this. So the scouts were here. They understand. They know better than anybody where to go, who to go watch, when to go watch them, and what games matter, even if it's exhibition season. Um, and again, I go back to Brazil's pro day. How wonderful was that to hear from those NBA guys that he just lit it up, looked like a lottery pick, when we had heard nothing really up until then about him even doing five-on-five -five live scrimmaging. So we're seeing progress. Today I thought he looked good. For the most part, there are things he'll clean up and get better at. Um, you know, there are some physical challenges in this game, and he's a guy that what I saw in the small sample size a year ago sometimes – was inconsistent when it came to that stuff and playing through it and dealing with it. Uh, but I thought he showed well for himself today in a lot, in many stages of this game. Uh, but the Arkansas Razorbacks defeat number three Purdue, 14th ranked Hogs, 81, Purdue 77. It went to overtime. It was thrilling. It was exciting. I hope you cut on an SEC Network Plus. I hope you get to watch it some other way if you didn't. I hope we gave you some details on our thoughts about it that make sense. I certainly talked a lot about some of the stuff that actually played out in pregame, so it's been a fun day for me before I head back to Little Rock. But before I do that, I've got to finish my game story, get it right. I've got a, I've got a sidebar to another story to work on and some other stuff. Uh, but I hope the coverage from Hogville lives up to your expectations. I hope you've enjoyed this. And we do have some questions. The polls changed a, a bit since the offseason started, so I don't know why they can't now. I mean, the polls, some of them probably do. Um, I'm not sure, I, I, you know, I don't know if AP re, re, does another poll until after the first week of the regular season. I need to, you know, I'm going blank on that. I don't recall if that's the case or not. There's, you know, uh, Ken Palm preseason has Purdue number one. CBS had one of its polls come out the other day at Purdue number one. The coaches, in their preseason poll had Purdue number two, AP three. So that's a big deal. Arkansas was 14, it seemed like, across the board. Ken Palm, AP, and coaches, everybody. Those three had Arkansas at 14th. CBS, I think maybe had Arkansas a little higher, or one of the CBS. They got multiple guys over there that put out polls. Uh, can an exhibition game affect the polls? That's what I'm saying. It, it's really going to be determined upon the get people that vote on it. You know, if they're paying attention to this and some of the basketball junkies that actually pay attention, uh, you, know, uh, you know, they're going to tell you that it doesn't matter a whole lot. One team was playing on the road. It was a great game. Uh, but I think it does help your perception, especially if you win some of the – I talked about how that tough non-conference schedule. Uh, and I think it helps Arkansas's perception 
winning a game like this, if they start 4-0 against teams they should beat at home and then have success in the Bahamas and then against Duke. And I think a game like this helps validate anybody that might be on the fence about bumping Arkansas a little higher, maybe over some teams where they're like, well, this team played three really good opponents. Arkansas only played two, but they did beat, you know, they did beat Purdue who brought everybody back. And yeah, it was exhibition, but it felt like, you know, it was a packed house. It wasn't a secret scrimmage. So there might be some value there in perception and, and how folks do things. 59 minutes and 55 seconds. I almost got it to the hours trying to sign off. I want to thank everybody. My sponsors, Parkway Automotive in Little Rock, um, Fence Brokers Inc. in Central Arkansas, as well as Jose's Bar and Grill in Tawny Town, where I did my pregame today. I'm going to be doing that throughout the year there. Um, but those are my three sponsors that I work with, and I always want to make sure I thank them. Thank you for joining me on Hogville Net YouTube Live for postgame analysis. Once again, the Razorbacks, 14th ranked, 81, number three, Purdue, or whatever poll you want to pick. Number one, Purdue, if you want to choose one of the ones where they, they got more than one, where they're there, 77 in overtime. What a great game, even though it's exhibition season in October. Signing off for now. See you next time.